Remember No Child Left Behind? That was so 2002. Congress has approved, President Obama has signed a successor to No Child Left Behind. It's Every Student Succeeds Act. That's, that's the law. To discuss that in broad parameters, Tony Evers, Superintendent of Public Instruction, welcome back. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate being here. Well, do, getting, I was intrigued by the research for this show. No Child, passed behind, no Child Left Behind left in 2002. Right. Its goal, by 2014, 100% 100% of students would be at grade level. How do we do as a nation with that? Well, that was an aspirational goal, uh, clearly. And I would say we, we're not there uh, as a nation, that every child is, uh, is, is succeeding at grade level. Or, uh, so, no, it, ha it hasn't worked. Uh, but I will say the, the law has some pretty good legacy, too. As far okay, as let's talk about what was good about No Child yeah. Left Behind and not so good before we get to the uh, ESSA. Sure. Well, the, the, um, the good part was that it, for the first time ever, required states to look at um, different groups of kids uh, separately as, as, as their achievement. So no longer could um, the majority, the, the white population, high test scores mask uh, some, under, some underachievement. And so that really did bring around a, a, a new way of looking at uh, achievement and how it impacts uh, especially different subgroups like uh, kids of color, kids that are economically disadvantaged and so on. So I think that's a tremendous legacy, frankly. Uh, and it really has focused uh, all states on closing achievement gaps, which is it's one of the most important things that our nation faces. So I think that's a great legacy. What, well, what about on specifics? I mean, um, how have our SAT scores done under No Child Left Behind? You, you've been in this business a while. They tr are not our SAT scores, but our, our state tests generally are trending upward. Upward. But slowly and not, not quickly enough. We continue to have high, gr high graduation rates. We're like third in the country or second in the country, depending on the measurement. So I think the trend line is good, but it's not good enough. But I, th I think Cho No Child Left Behind has caused us as a nation and us as a state to take a look at so how are African-American kids doing? How are Hispanic kids doing? How, and, and really trying to focus our efforts where we need to really uh, lift up some achievement. One of the legacies of No Child Left Behind was decades of controversies over failing schools. Yeah. Um, is that going to be a debate in the future as we go forward under the Every Student Succeeds? That's, that's a great question. I think um, the reality is probably yes. I mean, I, 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 the, I, the rhetoric around No Child Left Behind was, you know, if you don't, if not all of the kids are making it, eventually 100% of your schools will be uh, deemed failing. And then they morphed into the, uh, the waiver process. Yes. And that kind of changed that a little bit. But I, I just think the, the reason I think it, it isn't necessarily going to change is that it's part of the rhetoric now. And, and so no matter how we view it going forward, there will be some that view it as failing schools. Do you see the debate over failing schools as one of the uh, parts of No Child Left Behind that had the most problems? Yeah, no, with no, there's no question. I mean, schools because because one one person's failing school is not another's failing school. Are there no uh, certain specific standards, or, or why? Well, you? a you can't make a judgment like that based solely on a uh, one test, uh, one standardized test. But b it, it also assumes that a failing school is failing every single student in all areas, which is just baloney. I mean, it, so. The, uh, that certainly was one of the uh, downfalls of No Child Left Behind. In, in addition, I, I think, you know, thinking back on it now, the, the, one of the best reasons for passing this law is to kind of get states out of the, first of all, we are dealing with the federal government uh, with uh, No Child Left Behind as here's a new law, here's our regulation, so on and so forth. And then as they try to change the law then, and they didn't have any success, they went to this waiver process, right. and it, it just cost. And every state submitted its own waiver, right? Right. right, right. And they were signed off on by DOE, the Department of Ed, right? Right. right. And and it, and the regulations kind of changed, and things shifted over time. So it's good to have. We'll have at least a handful of years of consistency here, and I think that's a real positive thing for us. Um, one other part of No Child Left Behind: there was this race to the top, whereas if you submitted apps, you got additional money. Um, was that a good part of the national educational debate? It, 
One of the things race to the top did, it, it caused some states to um, kind of change some practice, such an educator effectiveness or educator evaluation and some other areas. So to to cause states to think through that process, I think was a good thing. But it just, there was a lot of money on the table and a lot of time spent um, chasing that money. Okay. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound sour grapes. We didn't get, we didn't get a race to the top grant uh, for K through 12. We got one for early childhood uh, in subsequent years. But it, it um, it caused, it caused, it was just a lot of work and a lot of preparation. I think overall the states that got the, got the, uh, the, the, the grants, I think it helped them as states to move their states forward. But as a, did it drive changes all over the country? I'm not so sure that happened. Okay, now let's, now let's look forward. Sure. Uh, the premises of every student succeeds, is it, more achievable, uh, do you welcome this change from No Child Left Behind to, every, to ESSA? And if so, why? Number of reasons. One is, uh, and I'll back up to the consistency piece, is that now we have a piece of legislation that's gonna be implemented both state and, and local, or local state and nationally and over at least a period of years that we don't have to worry about going back to waivers or, or having it reauthorized next year and change the focus. So having that consistency and frankly some bipartisanship uh, uh, I think it are kind of 30,000 foot things, but I think they are um, they're important. The other thing that it's done is it's it's shifted, you know, some people have portrayed it as, you know, this is a state's rights issue, everything's been turned over to state. Well, this is still a federal program, and we get 200 plus million dollars out of it. Is there more money in ESA? No, no there isn't. And okay. the budgetary piece is always separate from that's, the re yeah, that reauthorization. Would, that's through the funding process right. of Congress. And so that's, it, that'll remain the same, uh, or I suppose ostensibly go, go down. But the, um, uh, it, what it do does is it, it kind of shares some decision making. And for one thing, it, 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 it allows this, instead of turn, uh, turnaround programs for for schools that are underperforming the bottom 5%, mm -hmm. they had four or five specific things that had to be done. Well, those no longer exist. There's no required turnaround model, so to speak. But uh, in turn, what it does is it gives the state and those school districts that uh, are having these uh, lower performance, uh, the ability to kind of negotiate what's going to work well for them in, uh, in, their, in their school district. And I think that's a step forward, frankly. But I just heard you say something that I heard and hadn't heard before. Does ESS, ESSA, does it focus on the 5% and what's a, help me understand this 5% new, new, new guideline. Well, it's what we do with that 5%. That and, and the 5% are, are what? The, the lowest, um, uh, achieving s schools and uh, on our school report card. And uh, I just want to be sure I, I get it right. The lowest achieving by graduation rates, by SAT scores, by standardized testing. What? Yes. Uh, all, yes to all three. It's part of our part of our um, accountability system. Utilizes ACT graduation. Of course, uh, a large part of it is our uh, standardized tests and reading and mathematics, and not only how well schools and districts are achieving, but how are they doing in closing those achievement gaps. So all that, all that in, in the mix is, st is still there. What is wholly different is the federal government won't be giving, they used to have school improvement grants. Mm -hmm. They no longer do that. They just say X percent, and I think it's 7% of your allocation should be used for uh, t t helping schools in, in those lower categories. We can determine with collaboration of those school districts um, and schools, what that change is going to look like instead of having that compelled uh, by the um, uh, by the federal government. Well, New York Times columnist David Kirp said this about ES ESSA: Every Student Succeeds Act shifts for the first time since the Reagan years the balance of power in education away from Washington and back to the states. Do you agree? There's a shift. I I wouldn't say it's like now it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's not a sea change. No, I, that sea changes. You know, has there been any any change recently to to shift that? No, this does. And so I guess one could consider that a sea change. For example, they no longer require the federal government is no longer requiring uh, our educator evaluation system 
period. I mean, before they, there, we had to, it was required under federal law that we have them. It's required under federal law that some characteristics should look the same on that. That's gone away. That's gone? That's gone. Teacher evaluations are gone? As required by the federal government. Okay, thank you. That's a big deal. Yeah, that is a big deal, but we, it's in state law here in Wisconsin. And so I don't see a lot of change in that. I mean, people may want, I mean, now at the state level, if the policymakers are interested, um, make some tweaks to that. But I, I just don't see that changing much in, in, in our state because that, that system was developed by teachers and principals and, and policymakers. And so there's broad support for it. I mean, it's not without problems. But um, so I don't see that changing. But it is, the federal government is no longer requiring that. Simple as that. that is Fed, federal government is no longer telling us what um, failing schools, to use a poor term, need to do in order to turn themselves around. There used to be like five, four or five turnaround models that they've sanctioned. Now that's no longer there. So I think there is a shift, but a sea change, that might be a bit hyperbole. Does it give you as a DPI superintendent more, more authority? Does it give the governors of the state more authority? Does it give our... Uh, Depends on the state. Uh, in right. our state, uh, as you know, uh, uh, I'm an independent elected official, so that, that authority... Constitutional still, officer. Yeah, that still, authority still rests with me and e ESSA. But we, as we always do, collaborate with uh, you know, our partners on, on the Hill to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. But, but in other states, when the state superintendent and is appointed by the governor, clearly that's going to give the governor some different authorities. But again, there's just certain things that are already in state law. For instance, the, our accountability plan uh, that is required, was required and is still to some extent required by the federal government. They've given more flexibility. It's also in our state, state law also. So there's, it's not like we're going to be, it's not, it's not going to be a sea change. Let's just put it that way. Okay. What about the issue of testing? Will yeah. there be less standardized testing under every student succeeds? No. It, it, that remains uh, essentially unchanged. They give states some authority to investigate other ways of going about it, but the, there still is a requirement to have a, a single standardized test in grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, and once in high school. So that uh, hasn't changed, and, and frankly, that's, that, that's um, I, I'm okay with that. You're okay with that? I'm okay with that. It, we, we need to once a year do a a check on how we're doing as a state and, and individual schools do. I think some of the problem with uh, the standardized tests in the past is that everybody's kind of oversold it, like it's going to be, you know, you, uh, parents are going to know exactly what interventions are going to be needed with, for their ch child in order to succeed. And that's what, that's what standardized tests are for. Essentially, it's a dipstick. Look at, once a year, look at how a school or your own child is doing. It's not for the purposes of changing instructional strategies uh, the next day. So yes, we will make up the long story short, we still will be doing standardized tests here in Wisconsin. If I'm a parent, if I have one child in middle school and one child in high school, uh, I was being told under No Child Left Behind whether my schools were failing, correct? Yeah, right. Um, I'm no longer gonna be given those evaluations in those terms, correct? It'll be on, on the terms of uh, our, our present report cards, which are described um, in different terms, but they don't, they don't say failing. Well, but, but those report cards will still happen. I mean, th th there won't be much change in it. Parents will still, whether, whether the term is failing or underperforming or whatever, Fs. Mm -hmm. But that's for the school. Right. Uh, and, and have I been getting the test scores of my child in middle school and high school in math, in English? Yes. Have I been getting that? Yes. Okay. Am I going to continue to get that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that will happen. That uh, happened last year with my, my grandkids. They got their, uh, their report at home and that will continue. But, al but also schools will have their report cards under state law. And uh, so those, those descriptors will be available to parents too. As a veteran K-12 educator, what's, what do you believe, how closely do parents follow both whether their school is failing or whether the, uh, and how their children are doing on some of those standardized tests? I think they follow it pretty good. I mean, I, I think there are some parents that think there's over-testing, but you know, that, that's a bigger discussion about not only 
our three hours uh, of standardized testing, but other tests given throughout the, the year. But um, yeah, I think parents pay attention to it. And I think school districts uh, uh, value and uh, um, value the importance of our school report cards. I mean, we hear about it when a district goes from one category mm -hmm. to another every year. So mm -hmm. obviously someone cares. What does uh, Every Student Succeeds do, if anything, additionally for some of our, uh, for the Milwaukee school districts, the Madison okay. school districts, with their, you see, I don't have to tell you about the dropout rates. Right, yeah, and just achievement period gaps. Uh, yes. They're, they're significant in this state. What it's gonna do, and I, this goes back to what I said before, that 7% of money that, we, that will be set aside from the total allocation will go to uh, the most significantly underperforming schools, whether they're in Madison or Milwaukee or any place else. And that will help. I, I think we've got lots of other interesting and good things going on that can help us close those achievement gaps. But the, the No Child Left Behind, or ESSA, ESSA. Yeah, I'm gonna have to, the, work, I'm gonna have the, to work on that, uh, is foc is, continues to focus on the achievement gaps and making sure that all kids, especially economically disadvantaged and other kids, have a fair shake. That's that's actually the, the kind of heartwarming thing I have around uh, ESSA is that it was actually the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and it was passed at the same time all the Civil Rights Acts were, pa were acts were passed in the um, uh, in the 19 early 60s 63 mm -hmm. 64 the Voting Rights and so it's always been considered a civil rights bill in actuality and still is. Um, so I, th I think that's an important history to recognize because there are some people that are fearful that the states will not hold school districts as accountable as they were in the past because of this flexibility. And there might be some pressure to do that. I don't think there's going to be any pressure to do that in Wisconsin. I, I think it's really important that we continue. Educators believe that we should be held accountable and we'll, we'll continue to do that. What does Every Student Succeeds do to the Common Core debate? Tony? Uh, in my opinion, nothing. I mean, there still may be debate about it. Uh, the Department of Education never required anybody to, uh, they just require rigorous standards and that who, who can be against that. Um, so the debate really is kind of a state by state uh, issue, but note what ESSA does is it prohibits the department from requiring any standards and, uh, and they haven't in the past, so it, it's just kind of a proactive thing. So the, the discussion, in, in my viewpoint, we have 423 school districts that are now implementing the Common Core. They have the final authority. Uh, the legislature has not uh, intervened. Um, and the only way they could intervene is to say, local school districts, you don't know what you're doing. We know better. I just don't see that happening. Uh, and so I think what we're trying to do uh, is to kind of set up procedures and transparency so going forward, that everybody feels involved in the process. And we'll be probably releasing that, uh, that, that system in a few weeks. What's the timeline for Every Student Succeeds? Uh, does it, is it two years out or? It, uh, if I remember correctly, it's uh, beginning in the 2017-18 school year. So it, it, there's, it, it's, a th it's a thousand page document, more than a thousand page document. So, I can guarantee you, and this is no slam on those legislators, but there's no way any of them knows what's in a thousand pages. So now it's up for us to kind of discern that along with our help, helpful he friends at the federal government. So there's all sorts of rulemaking and other things that are gonna happen between now and implementation. We're so, we're so far from really knowing exactly what's in that bill. Small example, and something I'm frankly happy about, but the, um, for years, of, the military families associations have been pushing for uh, an ad identifier for individual kids that uh, come from mil military families. Because they're often moved around. They're often moved around and they, they want to know how their kids and how, how that, that, that lifestyle impacts their kids' l learning. Well, put in the budget, and I didn't know anything about it, I'm happy, but that is now a requirement that states have a, an identifier for mil military kids and homeless kids. So, and those things are really relatively large things and, and for someone, and there's no one in our department that knew that that was gonna happen either. So we have to get through those thousand pages and find out what's exactly in there. 
Okay, I understand it's a thousand pages, and there's uh, the Department of Ed has to do rules that have to be public hearings and approved and all that. Yep. Now let's talk about the process. Under every student succeeds, then do you draft a plan to implement it and do you forward that to the governor? What's the role of the governor and lawmakers here yeah. in terms of the next steps? Our, our Title I uh, process uh, does involve uh, some conversations with the governor's office and we'll, we'll have that when, that when we get that plan, but we're many months away from developing that plan. And the plan's gonna pretty much reflect um, what the law says, uh, so I, I don't think there's going to be anything extraordinarily controversial in the plan, but yes, we, we have some obligations to share it with uh, the governor's office and the governor himself. What are the new major policy decisions that the governor and lawmakers will have to make as a result of uh, Every Student Succeeds? They will, they will need to know that, they will need to understand that we have already in place pieces of statute that deal with some really important things around teacher evaluation mm -hmm. and our accountability system and we plan to encourage continued dialogue around that so that if there are any changes in that system. But they also need to know that we're going to stay the course on standardized tests that's, that's required. So they need to understand the law. I, I, I don't believe our Title I plan and our Title II plan is going to raise any particular eyebrows because they're going to need to follow what the federal government wants. Does uh, every student succeeds? Does it do anything uh, in uh, with charter schools? You best know, of I, your knowledge? I, to my best of my knowledge, no. But it, but there's se several pieces of legislation that have been kept the same. One is uh, community learning centers, uh, kind of the after school things. That that's in there. But uh, the charter school grant program, I believe, is I'm sure it's still in there. It's a competitive grant and always has been, always will be. Okay, based on what you know about Every Student Succeeds, what do Wisconsin teachers need to know? Will there be anything different? In their world, probably not. No? Yeah, probably not. If indeed we, we were starting from scratch on teacher evaluation and starting scratch from uh, our accountability system, um, no, the, the, then it would be something different. But I don't, I don't anticipate uh, th this reauthorization necessarily impacting everyday life in, in, in a teacher's world. What about uh, parents of K-12 students? They'll, they'll still see the same kind of tests that, uh, you know, in their, in their worldview, and in my worldview as a grandparent, you want to see how they do on the, on the standardized tests. You want to make sure that uh, uh, we're closing achievement gaps as a state. And so all those things that are important to parents uh, will continue to be important. And if every uh, student succeeds is a success, five and six years out, what's going to be different in, in Wisconsin schools? Well, I would, I, first of all, I think we will take a look at our uh, accountability system to probably add some things to it that um, haven't been part of it before. Right now it's basically basically based on graduation rate, ACT, and math or math and English language arts tests. Mm -hmm. I, I would like, and I know others around the state, and when the governor and I and uh, Senator Olson uh, uh, convened that accountability task force a couple years ago, we all kind of knew that this was a starting point. You know, we really do need to take a look at how um, uh, how, how we're allowing kids to be career ready. The whole career and technical education piece is just flat out missing out of that. And also, a lot of other stuff that we feel is important, such, such all those uh, uh, soft skills with people skills, such as getting along with people, team building, entrepreneurship. We need to have a good discussion around that. I'm not sure there's lots of measurements of those things, but there might be. And so I just think it would be good for us as, us as a state to take a look at Maybe there's some things we can make, put on that report card that will, that will allow it to be reflective of the values of Wisconsin. I think right now it's pretty narrow, and I think it can be broader and more meaningful. One of the criticisms of No Child Left Behind is that it was so uh, driven by standardized testing that things like art, music, phi ed didn't get um, emphasized. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that criticism? Well, it, there is a potential for that, yes. Um, I'm not sure it has happened. I, I would say the f some of the areas that you mentioned, Music, Art, and Fi had probably been impacted more directly by budget cuts than by No Child Left Behind. But there is, and that's why I want to see that report card expanded, because yes, do we want kids to be literate in math and, and good readers? Absolutely. 
-hmm. there's all sorts of other things we want to put in. And uh, I think those other things should be reflected in that uh, report card. If it's in our accountability system, then there's more guarantees that there will be this broad-based type of learning that most parents and grandparents like me want. Every two years, you ask the governor and lawmakers for a new school funding formula. Right. Does uh, Every Student Succeeds give you one more reason to argue for a new uh, funding formula, or is it apples and oranges? I, I, to some extent, it's apples and oranges. Okay. I, I think the, the issue, you know, if, if uh, ESSA in subsequent years was drastically cut in half, then that would make a huge argument. But I think the argument we make around adequate resources and a different funding system hold true regardless of the, of the federal commitment. Um, I'm going to get get your update. Was uh, DPI still in the process of picking another? You, well, you have recommended a, another vendor for our next standardized yes. test, right? Right. Where is that in the process? That's, that's a done deal. Um, it's a done deal. Right. Ed, ed, I'm trying to think of the Data Resources Corporation out of Minneapolis, right. and there's some. They have some office uh, offices here. We'll be doing the, the next test uh, for the next couple of years. And you've heard of the criticism. It's headed by former uh, Republican Senator <laughs> Susan Shannon Engerleiter. <laughs> do, do you want to respond to that? Sure. I, I, I've known uh, Susan Engerleiter for when she was uh, Senate Majority Leader. So I have no problem with that. She's, she's, she and her colleagues have created a well-regarded company. and. Uh, uh, and have served many states well, so I, I anticipate no, no problems with that. So, going from No Child Left Behind to Every Student Succeeds is a welcome change. Yes, absolutely. Consi there's going to be consistency. We're going to be continuing doing some things we do well. We're going to have some flexibility to do s some things differently. Is it a sea change? Not sure about that. But the fact of the matter, if it hadn't been changed, it would have continued down a path that uh, no one wants to go down. And if it succeeds, will Wisconsin still have the largest achievement gap in the nation, sir? I, I don't know. We will not. We, we cannot. I mean, that, that just, and will ESSA help us on that? Yes, but there's, all, there's some, some other stuff that we're going to be working on that we have to close those achievement gaps. It's absolutely mandatory. So your agency now is going through the 1,000 pages yep. and um, do you have to submit a plan to DO to, to, the, to the feds? Yes. Okay. Does does the governor and lawmakers have to sign off on the, or is this your initiative? The governor will. I mean, if the governor said I don't like this plan, we would still submit it. I mean, it, it, it's my authority. We will ask the governor to sign off on it, and uh, hopefully he'll agree to do that. And your deadline to submit that plan is that, years away. It's it's at least a year away, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. So every student succeeds. Good change. Yep. Absolutely. Superintendent Tony, yeah. Tony Evers, thanks very much for coming thank in you, to Steve. give us an overview. I realize it's early, but yeah. thank you very much. It's a good starting place. Thank you. Thank you.